Okay. Sometimes having things in uh, online and streaming is not that easy. If somebody could look, if somebody has Facebook and see if this slide is seen, I would acknowledge. Sorry for my delay and I will start. So I will try to shorten my talk because of the technical issue we had initially. So I'm very happy to have spent here a couple of weeks uh, back to a place in which I know since 20 years ago, roughly, and uh, with Paolo, Zevelino, and Joao. Okay. So my talk is more or less outlined here. So the first part, well, essentially the, what I will try to convoy is that there are essentially three main things that are somehow related. The latent acceleration of the universe might be induced by something that, uh, that is described through some kind of phantom fluid, and that phantom fluid could support some other regular structure in the universe, like uh, regular black holes and also wormholes. So the first part will be dealing essentially with, with the dark energy, and then the other part will be related to uh, some black hole, regular black hole solution and wormhole. So briefly, uh, as we all know, under the assumption that the universe is homogeneous and is destroyed, which seems to be the case, so essentially nowadays only 4% of the matter is correspond to matter, which standard matter, which we are made of, and the rest is dark in the sense we don't observe it directly. Okay. So either we observe it, uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so then I'm sorry. I will afterward uh, record the same thing and, uh, and then upload it. Uh, the other thing, I, because I cannot do both things at the same time. The other thing, uh, well, what I'm saying, so the other part is, is dark in the sense we don't observe it. So either we observe it through the rotation of things around the center of galaxies, which is the case of dark matter, or then through the fact that supernovas looks fainter than they should, and that's essentially what, would, uh, it, what, what led to the um, fact that there is, uh, the universe is currently acceleration, accelerating. This has been backed up by other observations, like, well, uh, supernovae, oops. Where is the stick? Okay, like supernovae, uh, measurement of the Hubble rate, bow, CMB, and so forth, okay? At the perturbative side, so this can be seen through the matter power spectrum, through the growth function, and, and so forth. Okay, from an effective point of view, so the current acceleration of the universe can be described through an equation state which is roughly minus one, so it's similar to a cosmological constant. Okay, so let me just grab the stick over there. By the way, has some history, so it was Michael and Alexander Schultz that we got it, and we bring this back. Yes. So, could be something on an equation of states roughly of the order minus one, like written there, could be a cosmological constant, uh, Kersens, other kind of scalar field evolving with matter, or it could be that the uh, that gravity GRs evolves in a different, uh, or it's different nowadays. I will not refer to this point on this talk, although I, in other talk I, I gave some seminar on that topic. Okay, so briefly. So we know that the universe is accelerating because it's actually the right hand side of that equation is negative, which means that we need some uh, new matter for dark energy and uh, the pressure of dark energy, which is the one that is making that the size of the universe A is growing, not only growing, but accelerating. So its second negative is positive. Okay, the simplest case, as I said, lambda C, the M are called light matter. And that's what is essentially shown on this, on this plot. So one way to characterize things, as the mathematician has showed us, is essentially by making a uh, Taylor expansion. So if we do that with the size of the universe, so essentially what we do is a cosmographic approach. So on this plot, what we have is essentially the fourth derivative, okay, for example, that plot over there, the fourth derivative of the scale factor versus the third derivative. In this one, the fifth derivative versus the third derivative. So if we could somehow characterize those terms, we can describe the expansion of the universe. And this is done here for three kinds of models. All of them correspond to the simplest one, which is known as W for dark matter. 
an equation of state constant for the dark energy psi, which takes three values. So the red one is slightly smaller than minus one, the green one is exactly minus one, cosmological constant, and the other one slightly larger than one, which is a clear essence, okay? So if we could somehow characterize all those Tyler expansion, we could describe the expansion of the universe. So this idea is known already for a while, and uh, Varun Sahmi, together with Alexei Saramiski and some of other collaborators, what they did was to do that uh, Taylor expansion in a smart way. And by smart way, means essentially that the different values take one for lambda CDN. So as soon as we see something that moves from one, we know that it's not lambda CDN. Now it comes the observational side. It's not at all easy to observe from the third derivative on one. So the third one is usually what is known as the jerk, and here essentially has been uh, replaced as S3, okay? On the past, which is essentially what we see over here, and over here, the three models are the same because dark and it doesn't matter. It's as we approach nowadays that there will be bifurcation on these models. From the perturbation, so, because that was background, okay? But we know that there are galaxies, okay? That there are stars. So not everything is homogeneous and isotropic. So we need to look for the perturbation. And essentially, for that, we need to uh, look at three uh, components nowadays. How does the gravitational potential evolve or change with the scale? And likewise, how does the perturbation on matter, dark matter, and on dark energy evolve? And if at all they evolve, because for example, for lambda CDM, there are no perturbations that energy density is constant all over time. So here what we have essentially is a plot of three, uh, of uh, one scale, which is 10 to minus three megaparsec. So those are scales that have recently entered the horizon. Our horizon nowadays is roughly of the order 10 to minus four, 10 to minus five megaparsec minus one, okay? So again, the red one would be uh, an equation say slightly larger than minus one, green one, cosmological constant, and the blue one, slightly smaller than minus, sorry, slightly smaller than minus one. Larger, sorry, than minus one. So at the matter side, there is no much of difference, so the three curves uh, essentially uh, overlaps. If we want to see truly how does the change, does change happen, so we have to make the ratio between the value corresponding to that cosmological constant and the one of lambda CDN, okay? And to check the perturbation. It's quite, uh, it's quite small. So there will be uh, delta M for uh, what is known as phantom matter will be slightly larger nowadays and then it will decrease, and the opposite for K, uh, for, uh, K essence, okay? Dark energy, well, it will have essentially symmetric behavior if it's phantom or not phantom, although that delta will have will be positive or negative. Okay. Now, if we look for the uh, how the, does a given scale, which is essentially what F sigma eight does, so essentially we look at these scales of the order 0.1 megaparsec minus one, they took that scale and then we see how does it evolve along uh, for redshift up to roughly 1.5. Well, if we look at delta M, what we are doing is we are uh, rather than, we are seeing how does the evolution happens for different okay. So here we fix essentially K and we look for the evolution. And how does essentially the perturbation matter evolves with the evolution of the universe. So the three models are essentially, they, 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 are, they fit properly the data. Now what's happening when the equation of states evolves on time that's what we will see, and which is essentially what the uh, part of the PhD of Immanuel was about, okay? So he did the theoretical part, and in the valley that I will show afterward did essentially the observational part and the fit, okay? And we both that was more or less at the same time. So let me just remind a few things. The first of all is, uh, I don't know if we are online or not, but one of the things that I would like to highlight is that the weak energy condition implies a little energy condition, and if we are online, that is a message for Yasir, okay, for so the discussion we had. So if the weak energy condition uh, holds, so there is no need to check if the, if the null energy condition, because it is applied. The dominant energy condition is related to the other two, and finally the strong energy condition is the one that all matter fulfill, but remember that in inflation this is not fulfilled. So nature already told us that it's, you know, we don't, I mean, this, doesn't hold always. So 
the energy condition do not need to hold all this. And inflation, as I said, is a clear example. So Ivanov, he was quite smart, so when we were looking for this three model, he realized that the three model we were uh, analyzing the, the question of state could be written on this way. Okay? So those three models we looked at, and so essentially three deviation from uh, uh, lambda CD. Okay? So one is a deviation such that the equation of state is slightly smaller than minus one, and this, there is a linear deviation with a constant term, and one which goes by the square of the energy density. And those three models, these two, three different things, the first one is what is known as a big a kind of singularity in the future, which is the strongest one, and it was only the uh, 99 uh, realized by Alexei Sarovinsky and then uh, by uh, Robert Caldwell and, and others, okay? Then we have, so this, as I said, is one of those singularities. Then we have smoother events like the little bit and little signal of the big field. And this is what they show schematically on this, on this plot, okay? In any way, if the singularity of the big field happens or not, this would be in a very large time, okay? At least of the size. With the observation we have nowadays, at least of the order of the uh, size of uh, sorry, of the age of the universe, okay? Now, the little bit is just the big lift times to our infinite time, so this would happen when the universe has a very large size, and the little signal of the will be something even smoother than this one. Now, those are models for dark energy, and the uh, question we add is, could this model uh, fit the data, okay? These three models that I mentioned before. And for that, essentially, we use a uh, few kinds of Observation, one is coming from supernova. The other one, as I will show, is bionicoustic oscillation, the, then the CMB shift, and then also the bionicoustic oscillation. So essentially, those are four kinds of measurements that, this, that give us information about uh, the geometrical parts corresponding to the uh, universe homogeneous and isotropic. So essentially, those are measurements of how does the Hubble rate change from whatever that's uh, uh, phenomenon we are looking at, supernova explosion, bioacoustic oscillation, or CMB, or the Hubble rate at different directions. So that's what was done. So we use a compilation of over 1,000 data, okay, supernova, for a gravity ranging roughly from nowadays up to two, okay? And as I said, so this, is, this information is quite important because it tells us about how does the direction evolve over time since the explosion of the supernova till nowadays, okay? Then, of course, we need to do uh, a statistical analysis, which essentially we are looking for to minimize the, the chi-square, okay? So, we will have our, uh, there will be some correlation with those measurements that we have to take into account, unlike the Hubble, uh, the Hubble rates that usually this uh, correlation uh, function of matrix is diagonal, so in that case, essentially the random coverage. Okay, so I mean, who is very good in coding, so essentially he took a part of this part of the work. Now, the CMB, as I said, geometrically is the same thing, so we are measuring how does the Hubble rate change from redshift 1100 till nowadays. There are less points, so if I remember properly on this work, we had about three points, okay. And uh, finally, for the, so again, uh, what I want to insist is that it's a measurement of how does some function of the Hubble rate evolves from that time to now, okay? Uh, we had the, uh, again, to minimize the chi-square metric, uh, taking into account the correlation that there are between the data. Then for the bionicoustic oscillation, so essentially the same thing, so there is a whole, there are more data than for the CMB shift. So the, uh, the supernova, they are telling us about phases up to redshift two. For the bow is one point something up to two, two something. For CMB, redshift the order 1,100. Then for the Hubble rate, as you see here, there is no correlation function. So the, let's say the correlation matrix is diagonal. And here what the, there is a whole list associated with that, that is, how does the Hubble rate evolve for different stretches? So at the end, you have your chi-square, which is composed of four terms, okay? Those coming from supernova, baryonic oscillation, CMB, and the Hubble rates. 
Okay, and then we apply this for three models, the three models that I mentioned before, three models for dark energy in which the uh, dominant energy condition is not fulfilled, essentially because the weak, uh, sorry, the null energy condition is not fulfilled. So we have, because we will be dealing with the perturbation of the fit to include as well the part corresponding to radiation, although nowadays it's minimal on the sense that it's of the order uh, of 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 4, the contents of nowadays. Okay? But because the perturbation will suffer since the radiation dominated epoch, for the fit we had to include it because those values will go afterward on the code that will describe the evolution of the universe since the radiation dominated epoch till nowadays. Okay? So the three models that we call dark matter, uh, the leading to a big grid, which means W is slightly smaller than minus one, then the little grid, this one over here, and the little signal of the big grid. Okay? So here are the results. Uh, well, here you can see that it's slightly smaller than minus one, but that was because of the prior that were imposed. So it was imposed that the equation of state when doing the fit is not uh, centered around the minus one, okay? So there is some bias on our choice there. So we have to be careful with that. On the, uh, on the work we did where there is interaction between dark matter and dark energy, that prior imposing that the equation of state is slightly smaller than minus one is no longer there. But still, we will see that it leads to an equation of state that is on this side of the uh, phase palette. So here what we have is essentially the, the preferred value for the equation of state, Z have a rate nowadays, okay, in terms of the other parts. Now for the little rip, so likewise, here the, it's the parameter that characterizes the deviation from lambda CDM, okay, and likewise here, okay. And finally, for the little signal of the big rip. So again, so this is the parameter that measures the deviation from lambda CDM. The uh, results on omega m are in agreement with what was expected from lambda CD. Now, which of these models are preferred? So, for the model we have uh, chosen, okay, uh, to prepare is obviously the lambda CDM. Lambda CDM is the preferred one because essentially the IPT criterion gets the smaller value. So, that criterion takes into account that models might have different members of degrees of freedom, so it doesn't make sense to look directly at the chi square to compare this one with this one because this one has one more parameter as compared with this one. Likewise, this one with this one and this one with this one. Now, so said so this from a background point of view, which means that essentially we are using just data, supernova, bow, H of Z, and uh, Bayer Costa constellation. So the model that best fit the, the, the data is essentially the one that will give us a smaller value for z on the feet over there, okay? So essentially, the big grid with the little signal of the big grid on this model. Okay. Okay, as we started a bit late, let me jump a part of the theory. So essentially, when we look at the perturbation, because we are in GR, so essentially it's roughly, it's enough to look for the perturbation of the conservation of the energy momentum transfer. So we will have three components, radiation, matter, and dark energy. So if we manage to solve these, essentially, with the help of uh, Einstein equation, which means essentially we get the gravitational potential, and it's derivative with respect to x, which is the log of the scale factor, we can get this solution over here. What do I mean by this? So very simple. So essentially, we look at the zero of your component and zero i component of Einstein equation, perturbed. And because we have a linear relation between the gravitational potential and its first derivative, in terms of the perturbation of matter and velocity, so we can invert this and we can say, well, the gravitational potential behaves linearly with the matter density this way, and its derivative behaves linearly with the uh, linearly with the perturbation of matter and velocities. Okay, once we have this, we go back, okay, and we plug it in. So at the end, what we have to do is to solve numerically six differential equations with some initial condition. Once we have these deltas, these, 
we have the total deltas and the total Ds, and therefore we have the gravitational potential, and we are bound. So that's what we do. So let me show you the result. Well, a few words about the initial condition. So we use the standard condition, which are what is called the adiabatic condition, which means essentially that everything somehow came from the same origin, which is inflation which set there the initial uh, seed for the structure that will form afterward. And from inflation, we know that the amplitude in the, the scalar perturbation have this, uh, this value with a given spectral index, which is beta. And we use Planck 2018. Okay? So nothing strange. Now, there is one point which is very important when you look at the perturbation of dark energy. And this is not a feature related to having uh, dark matter or, uh, sorry, phantom energy or quintessence. This is simply related to the fact that whenever we have a fluid with a constant equation of state, well, the speed, the adiabatic speed of sound is negative, and that can induce singularities. So what usually people uh, do is to invoke two speed of sound. So it's somehow, so what they are doing, and we did the same thing, let me see, where is the equation? Yeah, here. So essentially, we consider the perturbation on the pressure will have two pieces. One piece, which is the standard one, the adiabatic one, and another piece, which is a perturbation that somehow breaks the adiabaticity on this equation. And we need this piece because, as I said, independently if the null energy condition or not are fulfilled, this can be lead to a close-up. It's even happened for a constant equation of state larger than minus one-third, which means for an equation of state that fulfills the strong energy condition. Okay? W between minus one-third and zero fulfills the strong energy condition, but still the perturbation might close up because of that fact. So what the trick that everybody does is to include this new term, okay? Which somehow broke the adiabaticity of the perturbation. And that term, we set it to one, okay? Which is what is the value that is usually chosen. The perturbation for the dark matter, well, here are, is shown for different uh, modes. So the red one are those that exit first the horizon, which means essentially that it's in a phase uh, six. And then this one, the pink one, is the last to exit the horizon. Uh, nowadays, T is for zero, nowadays is this line over here and here, okay? So that's what is, what is essentially shown here. So this is how does the perturbation of matter evolve, and this is how does the uh, perturbation on the, uh, on the gravitational side evolve for different gases. Okay, now we have to impose initial condition, as I said, and uh, well, it does depend on the, on the model. And for example, for the dark energy, by imposing that nowadays, essentially we have the same value, which is what is done here, okay? So what happened is that back in the past, those perturbation might be slightly different. Because for a constant equation of state, which is the one with in red, the equation of state does not evolve, so the, the, the change is minimal. While for the other one that might change more, this one will be the little bit on the big bit, and this one the little bit, the change will be higher. But of course, this only, once we have measurement back here, we can say which one is, is would be correct. Uh, this is what you call the gravitational potential. So the red one, big bit, the green one, little bit, and the pink one is the little signal of the big bit for different k, okay? So k1, k2, k3, k4, k5, k6. Physically, what this is saying is the following. The later the scale entered the horizon, which means the closer is to our scale, the sooner the flip on the change of the gravitational potential on this kind of model will happen, okay? So this is uh, essentially we confirmed what was already known by other means. In this kind of model, so in the future, the galaxy will be the first to be ripped apart, then after with the smaller things, the nuclear side, okay? But this is another way of proving this. It fits the data, as we saw the perturbation, uh, so we are in agreement. Uh, nowadays, uh, Amin is working on the code so that the fit that we have is using the background side, the perturbation side, we have still to improve it to include this F sigma. So essentially what we did here, 
we have the background model, we calculate the perturbation, and then we uh, see if they are within the range of the points. The idea is to make the fit of both things, the background and the perturbation. Okay, and this is an idea of Imanon who said, okay, what, uh, what would happen if those CSD that we put there observationally, I mean by hand, which everybody does, equal to one, we change it. So it cannot change too much from one, because as soon as we move to zero, which is, for example, what happened for dark matter, there will be clustering. We see galaxies that have dark matter. We don't see galaxies in which there is a cluster of dark energy. Okay, so yes, CSD can change, but not too much from one. Okay, so that's the first thing we, uh, we observed here. Uh, the effect on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the gravitational potential is similar. Similar in the sense, if we are too close to zero, what will happen is that all the structure will be ripped apart, no matter which size, which we know that in principle from other models this cannot happen. So that's depend on the scale. So again, what we have, sorry. What we have is that uh, CSD should be close to one. This is just a zoom on the, on the on the previous plot. So let me, so all this was phenomenological and let me just, what, uh, can we have a model that somehow, uh, okay, no, sorry. This part, are, as I'm a bit late with the delay we had initially, I will, I will skip it. So briefly, what we did here was to consider the previous model but including interaction, okay? And that interaction has to be uh, had to be linear on the uh, energy density related to dark energy. Why? Because there are some works in which this, uh, this is already preferred observationally, done by Elsie Abdallah in Brazil and collaborators. So what we did was essentially to use an interaction which is proportional to raw dark energy and raw, raw dark energy. Now what happened here is that because that interaction, which essentially said is that part of the content of the matter side of dark energy will be given to the dark energy side, what would you expect that it will happen if we have already a big rip, a little rip, a little signal, the big rip? It's a question for the audience. If we have already a rip and we give it more energy, what do you think it will happen? Back of the Serenda March. So that's what happened. So it was not very smart from our side. So when I start checking this, uh, the analytical calculation, I realized, well, we didn't do much. And indeed, this is what is preferred observationally, but what happened, if we have already a rip and we give it more energy, so we will not exit. So uh, although observationally it works, okay, so it fits the dates and everything, but from a theoretical point, we didn't reach much by taking this, this, uh, this, uh, this part, okay? So what I mean is that we had the big rip, a little rip, a little signal of the big rip, and we ended up having three big rips. Theoretically, we didn't uh, improve the, solve the problem, although the fit was okay. So this is for the first model. You remember, yes, uh, big rip with interaction. So now, as you can see, we didn't put uh, the value more or less between minus 1.2 and minus 0.8, and still you can see that there is slight preference for values slightly smaller than minus one. Okay? This is the value of the interaction, positive, although we uh, observationally, we, I mean, the, the, sorry, we put here value that will be positive or negative, but observation, they tell us they prefer the case dark matter into dark energy, which is uh, in agreement with the work of Elsie Abdallah and, and Colette. So this for the first case, okay, so the, the, the value of omega n is roughly around 0.3, the equation fits light, we cover smaller than minus one, the coupling has to be positive, decay from dark matter into dark energy. And this is observation, this is not us putting any, uh, any uh, value for that, for that work. For the literary, for the same thing, so at the end we, what we have, if there is interaction, what we have is that there is a big rip, the values of omega n, that would be preferred, lambda, we thought, I think, observation is telling us there is a preference of decay from dark matter to dark energy, and likewise for interaction with the signal of the big. Okay? 
for lambda again is positive. But this is observation, okay? So it's the observation that is telling us that lambda uh, is positive, which means that decays dark matter into dark energy, okay? Well, uh, if we compare the difference model on this with lambda CDM, it's action with lambda for light matter, big dip, little bit of the CDM of the big dip. So here are the difference fits. And the most important table, I think, is this one. So which one is preferred? So the one that is preferred on this case, side from interaction lambda for light matter, is this one here. Why? Because this one somehow mimics a constant equation of state that's closer to. Uh, minus one. But as I wrote here, oh, notice that all this interaction they will lead to a big dip. Okay. Why? Because there is a decay of dark matter into dark energy. The fit again, they fit quite well the data. Okay. So the, here are, we have the four model. Okay. And here how does it change uh, slightly as we compare it with lambda CDM. Okay, and then, um, so far this has been everything phenomenological in the sense that, uh, uh, that we had the perfect fluid. Can we have, have do something more from a more fundamental point of view? And the answer is yes, and this could be done in the context of three thoughts. So, uh, why three thoughts? So, uh, well, essentially, it has been uh, invoked quite a few times as a way of solving the cosmological constant. Why? Because in absence of a potential, it behaves exactly like a cosmological constant. Uh, and then, well, it's, uh, it, is, it can appear also in string theory. And uh, Sravan, during his PhD here, he worked with uh, quite a few with these uh, three forms. And when I was here, so then we started doing some work that's related to the uh, dark energy uh, dark energy side. Okay, so this is a possibility. So yeah, we can have uh, this phantom model from a more fundamental point of view, encoded on three thoughts. Okay, so uh, non-Gaussianity was done uh, both of you with Strava. Uh, inflation was done by Nelson Nunes and Antonio Cogisto, also for some dark energy models. Okay, let's see if I don't miss anyone. Yeah, so essentially more or less this. There was also some uh, Asian people, I'm sorry that I, now I don't remember their name, that they did some interaction on, uh, between dark matter and dark energy, these three forms. Okay, so what is a three form briefly? If uh, somebody here does not know, so essentially it's a totally anti-symmetric covariant tensor, okay? So when we are in four dimension, we have essentially four types of those fields. The scalar field, like the inflaton, we can have vector field, we can have two, uh, four, three, four, and then essentially four, four, okay? So if it's zero, so what we have is a scalar field, vector field, uh, two degree of freedom, three, four, four, uh, four degree of freedom. So I said four form, but four form in this case would be just the covariant derivative of this uh, tensor with three indices, okay? So aside from a scalar field, the next simplest things that we can invoke is a three form. Keeping in mind that we live in a universe homogeneous and discrobic, but we can also invoke a vector, but then we have to be careful so that we don't break the isotropy of the space time. So the action that would describe this three form is the one shown here. So essentially it's kinetic term, which is the derivative of the three form, and then with a given potential. Why does it, this can represent the cosmological constant? Essentially, if this vanished, so this F is essentially constant, and then at the end, what we will have is a constant state. Okay, if we are in, uh, these are most of us know it, if we are in a homogeneous and isotropic universe, so essentially what happens is that the Hubble rate will evolve this way with the three form, okay? This time is essentially the degree of freedom that is left after decomposing the three form. There is only one degree of freedom, which is that time. Uh, why the the got our uh, got the, uh, our eye? So essentially, notice that we have a minus here. Okay, okay. So even if this side is is positive, 
Okay. Sorry. When we sign this policy, we will have that the Hubble rates uh, grows in time. Okay. Even though that the kinetic term we have here is the correct one. So that was the, the issue that, at least in my case, attract my attention. What I mean is the following. So even though we have the correct kinetic term, then these three forms can be make quantum matter. So we, uh, this, the evolution of this three form can be written in a way that essentially is, is similar to that of a scalar field with an effective potential whose derivative would be this one. So let me show you graphically two simple cases. These two simple cases are the ones shown here. So either we have a minimum or a maximum on the potential. So either we have a minimum that is shown there or a maximum that like is shown as that. So essentially, the three forms are quite peculiar in the sense we have two uh, fixed points which is independent of the potential. And this, this one is chi c minus chi c, which is related to the value that gravitates in the constant. So essentially, at the end, the three form is stuck somehow here, okay, or here. So if we have a potential that has a maximum, these points over here correspond to little theta on the beginning. So that was one of the things we, we showed back. And the most important thing. So all what we have seen before from a uh, phenomenological point of view within a uh, perfect fluid, it happened, sorry, they, for the perturbation, they fit also the data, okay? How much time do you have? 10, 15 minutes? Sorry, that's uh, because of the technological problem. 10 minutes. Okay, so then let me say a few words. Ramon Dark and the singularities in Chile. Now, if we have things that blows up, means that the energy density at some point will get very large. And if it gets very large, there is somehow a regime in which we expect quantum effect to be very important. Right? So now, what happened with these singularities? First of all, which theory of gravity uh, we need to choose, well, I have no, uh, no answer for that because there is no, as far as I know, there is no very posed uh, quantum cosmology, quantum gravity theory, although there are many approaches. One of the approach is the one based on the Willard de Witt, which is essentially the analog of the Schrodinger equation, okay? And we have also loop quantum cosmology inspired in loop quantum gravity, we have string theory, triangulation, and so forth. So there are many. There is a zoo. So the one that we apply in this case was the Willow the Wheat, simply because it's the one I'm familiarized with it. Okay? I will say a few words anyway in what we try to look. So this, uh, most of this in life we have been analyzed using the Willow the Wheat equation. And uh, in most of the cases it has been shown that the singularity is removed. What does it, this mean in this context? So it essentially means that when you solve the wheeler de Witt equation, which is the analog of the Schrodinger equation, you have solution in which the wave function vanish close to this event. And that can be interpreted that the probability of reaching that region is very small. And the probability is very small, then it's unlikely that this would happen. Now, if we are in the context of loop, so what happened essentially is that the effective Friedman equation has a maximum at the energy density, okay? So that happened for the big three, for the little sibling, for the little sibling of the big three, let me say, for the big three singularity, all the singularities that involve a difference on the energy density. So the effective equation of loop quantum cosmology will avoid this kind of singularity. Okay, so it also uh, solved the problem. Maybe for the sudden singularity, depending on the Sorry, not the sudden singularity, type 4 singularity, because then the energy density might be finite, and seeing the singularities there, I don't know there, I will put the question mark. So here's a simple example. If we have a mean of the scalar field, uh, that's drive uh, a little signal, of, uh, little signal of the big big singularity, so that is what is shown here. So the potential is symmetric, because it's quantum in this case, that's why the minus sign here is going to come. We did similar this. Some anal similar analysis in three form with uh, David Rizuela and Iñaki Garay, and the result was also similar. The Willard-DeWitt equation is different because instead of 
but in Scala field we have a three fold which would be at least similar process. Okay. Those that want to know if if they want to know more, so here recently we had this review that's following by for school by. So it's an F of R metric series of modified gravity. And within GR, and also some modification of gravity, so there is this review by Klaus, Prado, and, and myself, okay? And now, as we said, so we have uh, dark energy. This is a fact that dark energy is compatible with phantom, which is also an observational fact. Now, if we have phantom, we know that mathematically it will be solution corresponding to wormhole. Okay. So what we did on, on this last part, in the last five minutes, so let me speak about two work we did recently. One is, can we have black holes that are regular? And why regular? Because phantom, what the effect that it has is that it's a repulsive. It's repulsive. So because it's repulsive, maybe we can read off the singularity that we have, for example, inside of Schwarzschild, okay? because of those repulsive effects. And then one home, because we have in naturally, in nature, the 70% might be of the form of fat. Okay? So somehow what I'm trying is to uh, connect the three, uh, the three uh, parts of my thought. First, the phenomenological side that can be described through three forms, more from a fundamental point of view. And once we have this fundamental point of view of three forms, we can see that there are indeed some solution, at least mathematical solution, that describe regular uh, black holes and also we will have wormholes. Now, we know that uh, GR predicts singularities and we have seen a few of them related to dark energy. We have the big one also at the beginning. But there are other kinds of singularities like those related to black holes. And why would we care about black holes? Well, essentially because uh, on the last year uh, there have been many events detecting them either through the, uh, the production of gravitational waves they produce when they merge, or essentially because we have the kind of picture of one of the orbiting, uh, the orbits around the, the black hole, the, the, the east coast, okay? So there are, uh, and also because as we know that at the center of our galaxy there is also a black hole, so this is, is a fact. So that's why we should care about that. Now, from the other side, as I said, 70% of the matter in our universe nowadays is dark energy, and that dark energy could be of phantom nature. And uh, this phantom nature, for example, can, although I didn't mention it at the beginning of the talk, could alleviate the tension that we have in H0. What does this mean? So essentially, the measurement that we have, we infer of the Hubble rate in relation to obs recent observation, like supernova and bow, let's say supernova, mainly supernova, give us a value of H0, which is slightly larger than the one we infer from physics at higher redshift, redshift around 1,000 and a half CMB. So there is a tension somehow on that value of H0. And phantom model somehow alleviates this tension, okay? Now, on the other hand, this, uh, this um, phantom dark energy, if it's there, then it could support the existence of wormhole because it's precisely that kind of matter that we need to have wormholes. So let me just end with these two questions, so regular black hole and wormholes. Those uh, regular black holes, uh, well, not regular black holes, sorry, black holes used in three form have been also analyzed by Francisco Lobo, a collaborator, as well as wormholes. But we follow two different approach, as I will show in, in a moment. So essentially what we were looking for is, is to have regular black hole rather than black hole properly, because black hole properly, we already have them in GR in that. So, uh, so what's happened is that uh, if you have a static and spherical asymmetric black hole, then it can be described through a Tantowski such uh, anisotropic metric. So essentially you need two scale factors instead of one, like in Friedman Lemaitre or so on. So we have two scale factors, A and B, okay? And then we'll have matter content, and that matter content Corresponding to a three form can be encoded in a single uh, variable chi. Okay? And then we will have our potential. So, what we did was essentially, let me explain it briefly and very, in a simple way. Close to the event horizon, we have Schwarzschild. Can we get a solution that's far away from that event horizon, uh, avoid the singularity? And the answer is yes. So, let me just show what we did. So, we have two scale factors, A and B. Okay? So, when we describe this black hole as a uh, such a uh, uh, 
space one. So close to this horizon, B is equal to one. Okay? Now, as we approach the C black, which matches the red line, so this B becomes zero, while the A blows up. So what we did was close to the horizon, okay? So this model essentially uh, are similar to uh, Schwarzschild, okay? But instead of having uh, Schwarzschild at the singularity, what we did essentially, we choose a different function that is similar, as I said, a different horizon is similar to Schwarzschild, likewise for A, but then when we approach the singularity, that in the case of, Sch of Schwarzschild, this happened at a finite time, okay? So this, in this case, this function goes to infinity, okay? So that's why we avoid the singularity. So I repeat, close to the event horizon is Schwarzschild. Away from it is not Schwarzschild. So that's why we remove the singularity, okay? So it, uh, the trick was essentially that this time if it goes to zero, okay? When we are in Schwarzschild, so we put something that asymptotically goes to a constant that is different from zero. Asymptotically, so not at a finite time. Okay. Uh, take that. okay, what happened with the three form? So essentially, at the horizon, it doesn't do much, so it sits in zero, its value is essentially zero. And as we go asymptotically, so that this P which happened at the finite time value is at infinity, so this affords some constant value and likewise the potential. We had to pay the price, and that price notice that the potential is negative. Okay? essentially. Uh, if we look at the curvature, so the curvature is finite, likewise for this, uh, I forgot now the name, Thanks. K, Thanks. exact, is the contraction of the two Riemann uh, tensor. So if we are in Schwarzschild, blows up at the singularity, which is here, this dashed line. If we are away, it goes to a constant. Okay? So there is no singularity. The price to pay, the null energy condition, is not fulfilled. Okay? From a compactified point of view, so essentially before we had the finite singularity, okay, space like uh, space like singularity at the finite time. Now we have a future infinity, send c to infinity, okay. And asymptotically, it is it behaves like a Nabai space time. So what this is done, and this I think is very important from a cosmological point of view. Somehow we compactify this site, starting from a negative potential. This in cosmology is very important, at least in string theory, because it's not easy to start from a negative cosmological constant and get something compactified, which in addition it behaves like the city. Okay? So that may be some idea for the future. Using cosmology, okay. from a cosmological point of view. Finally, I know that you have to go, you have to teach, and I have to buy back the thing. For the. Uh, ah, sorry, one word. What is the difference between the approach that global and collaborator use and we did so in our case what we assumed was we don't know the potential we don't know anything we know only the physics and we know that the physics is telling us that there is an event horizon okay so what we did was we assumed that there is an event horizon similar to Schwarzschild and we integrate on the case of Francisco Lobo and collaborator they assume a given potential for example a zero potential and then they got uh, Schwarzschild into the city or Schwarzschild the city which is normal or then uh, for the uh, for the one part, the same thing. So they fixed the potential. We didn't fix the potential. We assumed some given condition, and then we evolve and see what is the potential that we will get. The same thing we did here. So in this case, the uh, the metric is this one. This P R R is the size. Uh, the minimum value of R will correspond to the the mass of the one hole. Okay. For solving this numerically, it was easier to use uh, dimensionless variable. This small x related to R capital X related to capital R. Uh, this lambda related to the, uh, we use the quartic potential, like the one uh, shown there, lambda is positive, but when written in terms of chi, we have a potential, a double well potential, okay? And then chi, which is essentially of psi, the dimension is part related to the three form, okay? Now what are the conditions imposed? So essentially, that there is, we have a minimum value for R, which is the mass of the, uh, of the wormhole. Lambda, uh, we assume it was positive. And then the flowing out condition, which means that there is a minimum for R, 
which means the first derivative at that point will vanish, and the second derivative will be positive. Okay? And then we had to do it using, a, of, of course, the evolution equation. So we had an evolution equation for chi 1, and the geometrical part will give us three equations. One of them is a constraint. So essentially, we had to solve three differential equations and uh, uh, afterward check that the constraint equation is perfect. Uh, no matter this was done by Xiu and Seiyu Shen, and the result is essentially shown here. So the minimum, so x going to a zero, or its log going to minus infinity, is the mount. So the mount is somewhere here. This x is the minimum value of the radius, which is the mount. The larger is lambda, the smaller is the mass. Okay? As we approach the mount, the new energy condition is uh, just one slide and I, I will finish. As we approach the, the mouth, the null energy condition has to be uh, violated. Otherwise, of course, we don't have a world. Okay? Uh, the smaller is, uh, the smaller, uh, sorry, the larger is the value of lambda, the smaller is the value of V3 form. That's important because as we approach here, we are approaching Schwarzschild. Okay? So schematically, this is what's shown. At infinity, the three form is zero. Then it will go down the potential and up, up to where the null energy is not fulfilled, and then it will reach the mass. Okay. Now, why is this important? So, because this, for some value of lambda, and with this I will finish, and it's something we have still to, to keep working on it, it's mimic Schwarzschild. So, what we see, or what people saw in, in Eagle Live, it's, it's the image that you have from outside, and this thing can be mixed by your world. Okay, so that is the nice feature about this. this so three for three for one hole can be black hole mimic. Okay, and sorry for my delay for the technical uh, issue we had initially. I don't know if this has been recorded or not. If not, I will do it afterward and then send send it and you can upload it. Okay. So thanks for your attention. I think so. It's one of the things that I'm. Uh, For those texts that talk yes. uh, quantum theory and singularities, yes. yeah. and our grams will be appear in a uh, different form. Yeah. Okay. That's for sure. Yeah. Okay. Now, how complicated is the potential? This <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but that's for sure. Okay. Okay. Concerning your, uh, the three forms and the three forms that you are back for, yes. you say the mean is equal to black hole. Very far away. No, those are two things different. One regular black hole and another thing mimicking of wormhole. Ah, mimicking of wormhole. Yes. Okay. It's two different things. Yeah, it's two different things. But this regular black hole is very far away. Maybe by the black No, that's why. Because, ah, no, no. The, what we looked is inside the inside horizon. The we don't know what's happened outside. Okay. So essentially, the, the work of Lobo, they look outside. Mm -hmm. Okay? We looked inside. Okay, and this one, the, the, the thing is a black hole, so very far away. Yes, yes. 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 So let's say, so what they see is one of the orbits, okay? So that's the picture. So that picture is similar when lambda is very large. That picture is similar when lambda is very large. Well, large, has some value. So here you see the log. This was fashion. So that's what I mean. So, said in other words. So here we have the value of the three form. So the larger is lambda, the smaller is the value of the three form. And the closer we are to Schwarzschild. Okay? If we were here, it's exactly Schwarzschild, because then there is no matter. Okay, so we have Schwarzschild. There is a range. In between, in which what you see from outside, okay, it's similar that what we would see if you have a Schwarzschild. I think that's 
that's important because at the end, what we in these two work, what we have seen is possible to have something that looks like shvashim, but it's not shvashim, which means that it has no singularity. Okay. So now it is just a question of testing the version of the object. Yeah, but that's much more difficult. <laughs> That's much more difficult. Okay, so I think we have been online, so we not have to repeat this. Yeah, yeah, we are there. Okay, but there is nothing. Okay, I will check afterwards. No, no. Ah, uh, finalizar transmisión de prueba. Oh, oh, oh.